All right. If I could have your attention, please. Welcome, everyone, to Western Reserve Land Conservancy's headquarters and to Harmony Hall, which I'll tell you about in a second. This is our Nurturing Our Conservation Land Ethic Program in honor of the 75th anniversary of Otto Leopold's, the publishing of his seminal book, A Sand County Almanac, which I'm sure all of you treasure as I do. First, I wanna send a special thanks to Tom and Kathy Lydon for generously supporting this program and this entire visit for Buddy. The Lydons, as you all know, are devoted supporters of conservation and they've done so much to increase awareness here in Cleveland and beyond, including out of the state of Ohio even. And we're very proud to partner with them on this event. Let's give them a hand. I also wanna thank the dozens of people who worked so hard to make this event happen. The event planners on our staff, the caterers, the valet, the IT people, that was interesting. And so many more hands make this sort of thing happen and we often don't thank them. In particular, I wanna call out the incomparable Renee Veronica. Let's give her a hand. Our director of conservation education outreach and as she so often does, she pulled off another world-class event, thank you. This is a live in-person event, as all of you know. It's also a virtual event. There's a webinar happening right now as well. We wanna welcome our webinar guests also. Um, for those of you who are here, you are sitting in Harmony Hall, named in honor of our uh, late trustee, Dick Grimm, and Aldo Leopold. I'm not sure if all of you know this, but Aldo Leopold was Dick Grimm's personal hero. And uh, Dick was probably the most, undoubtedly the most influential trustee in the history of this organization and a Sound County Almanac was the most influential book in Dick's life. So we named this, as we were completing the headquarters, Dick died and we named this hall in his honor and all Leopold's honor. And if you're here at the end, there's an inscription on the wall explaining the relationship between Dick Grimm and Aldo Leopold. Um, Leopold's philosophy of harmony between men and land shaped Dick's core values and ultimately our organization's core values. And both Leopold and Grimm viewed everything in a very holistic way. All things, people, enterprises, communities themselves are essential parts in a vast interconnected system operating hopefully in perfect harmony, which is achieved through cooperation, communication, and reflection. As Leopold famously said, conservation is a state of harmony between men and land on that timber where it says exit for those of you in the front and for those of you in the back, you may be able to look up and see it. It actually has that quote from Leopold. We think it's that important. It's the only quote in this entire room. Curiously, Dick and Aldo shared several traits. Both were of German descent, both lived in Iowa and Wisconsin, both attended Yale, both were lovers of ducks and duck hunting, both were fond of whiskey, both were avid, maybe even obsessed planters of trees. And for all of these reasons, it is extra special for us to celebrate this 75th anniversary here in Harmony Hall. Before I introduce Buddy to all of you, I wanna share with you my personal story about Otto Leopold and this magnum opus that he wrote. When I was in high school, right around the corner from here at university school, one of our English teachers uh, assigned a Sand County Almanac as our summer reading. I don't know about all of you, but I'm surprised that I bought the book, more surprised that I started the book. I'm not surprised that I finished it. I don't think I put it down. It's probably the only summer reading I ever completed. And I've read it dozens of times. It has shaped my life's philosophy and my life's work. And I've probably shared it with 100 people or more. Leopold's sophisticated and yet simply stated wisdom gave rise to the core values and strategies that have shaped this work at the Land Conservancy and that continues to shape us today. I'm proud to say, I think Aldo Leopold would have been very, would have loved actually, the Land Conservancy's approach to conservation. We have adopted wholesale, his holistic approach to conservation. And I think he would have particularly loved how we work in a great diversity of places, natural communities and landscapes 
from the uninhabited wilderness to the farms and forests we use for food and fiber to the parks and preserves that dot our exurban and suburban areas and even to the abandoned city lots that we reforest by planting thousands of trees just as he did so many years ago. And now I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Buddy Huffiger. Buddy joined the Aldo Leopold Foundation in 1996 as a seasonal intern and, served as its and has served as its executive director since 1999. During his tenure, the foundation has grown enormously to become an internationally significant voice and conservation advocate and sentiment builder. Most importantly though, Buddy is an incredibly fun and nice human being and a person who inspires all of us to be more and to do more, especially as conservationists. Leopold famously began this book with these words, quote, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot, end quote. Like many of us here at the Land Conservancy, Buddy is one who cannot. Please welcome Buddy. people who cannot live without wild things. Really great to be here with you tonight. Uh, what I'm gonna share a little bit is, why are we still talking about a book that was written 75 years ago? And what has to happen for us to continue thinking about and talking about a land ethic 75 years from now? Or maybe even why, what we have to do for conservation itself to be relevant 75 years from now. There are two big milestones that we're celebrating as part of the Leopold legacy this year. One is the 75th anniversary of the Sand County Almanac. The other is the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Gila Wilderness Area. Anybody ever heard of this place before? A few. Uh, it was our world's first ever designated wilderness area. And if you're not familiar with wilderness, it is a designation of land that is the most protective of any kind of land use protection that, that our country offers a place, uh, and it's now that our system is the international model for wilderness protection. And this idea emerged in, 19, in the early 1920s when Aldo Leopold, a young forester, was stationed out in New Mexico and came across this really wild and lovely place that he knew the best thing for humanity to do would be to protect it, to ensure that even as a national forest, it wouldn't be uh, managed for timber or for grazing or for recreation, that it would be protected uh, in its kind of natural state. And so uh, later this year, there will be events also in New Mexico celebrating the importance of uh, recognizing this kind of act of restraint that humanity must in special and sacred places exercise. So again, this year, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Sand County Almanac, part of some other gatherings that you could uh, patch into. Uh, the first week in March is what we call Leopold Week. We have a, a group of speakers I'll share later uh, that are available to the world, literally, uh, virtually. And then there'll be these 100th anniversary events in New Mexico and in the Southwest, uh, and then other virtual programming on the kind of legacy of Leopold and the land ethic. So uh, Rich quoted the first line out of the book. I always argue this is the most important line of the book. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. His whole book is built on taking the reader on a journey to learn to understand the land, uh, to then diagnose its challenges, and then to care for it, care about and care for it. And really what he is challenging us to do is recognize that we are a part of the biological world, not apart from it. And when we do that, we'll extend the same ethical care and consideration to the uh, flora and fauna as we do our friends and family, right? That, that will expand the boundaries of our community. And the data is clear that we're not doing that right. Right, all of the indicators are moving in the wrong direction. Uh, and if you can't uh, see this graph, it doesn't matter. All you need to know is that top line is recording 2023 as the warmest year on record, right, by a substantial amount. 
So that's the background. And the solution is really still all up to all of us. Leopold then closes the book, A Sand County Almanac, with the phrase, I've purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the minds of a thinking community. So he was entrusting all of us to understand what our role is and what we can do to ensure that we take care of the land, not only for its own sake, but for our sake. I'm just gonna give you a quick little bio uh, of where he came from and how he came to write this book. He was born in 1887, pretty long time ago, right? In Burlington, Iowa, uh, on, along the Mississippi River. His family's company was a natural resources company. It was the Leopold Desk Company. They made furniture out of Midwestern hardwood. And so as they saw the Midwestern landscape get clear cut, they began to get worried about you know, their own economic livelihood. And Leopold, meanwhile, loved to spend time in the field. Any chance he got, he was outside. He was hunting, he was fishing, he was hiking. He was spending time outdoors. Oh, yeah, got a little delay here. I'll, I'll figure it out. So this is what his family seen and what they're getting worried about, uh, recognizing the, the impact to their raw material. I wonder if I do it this way. There we go. So what does he do? He goes to the Yale School of Forestry, really the only option at that time for somebody interested and concerned about natural resources. He graduates from the fifth graduating class of the Yale School of Forestry. He's already sticking out. This is him in the front row with the, the white suit. Uh, and he gets sent out to the Arizona Territory. It's not even a state yet. Uh, upon graduation, and works for the US Forest Service. It's there that he meets his, uh, the love of his life, uh, Estella Bergier, uh, and in 1922 proposes the Gila Wilderness Area, which would get designated two years later in 1924. And um, he then gets, there's a complicated story, but he gets transferred back to the Midwest where uh, he has an administrative job with the U.S. Forest Service and gets tired of that and so leaves this kind of cushy job right before uh, the, uh, the market crashes and begins working on his real love, which was wildlife. And so for several years, he is an independent contractor doing game surveys across the upper Midwest. He does some in the Southeast and some in the West uh, and starts writing his book, Game Management, which would be published in 1933. Now, a lot of people talk about a St. County Almanac as being this visionary book, but I think this is one of the best examples of how Leopold was ahead of his time. He starts writing a textbook for a field that doesn't exist until he gets hired to teach the first course ever two years later. So, uh, and that becomes kind of the fundamental first text really of, of wildlife ecology and scientific management of, of natural resources. Uh, by the 30s and late and into the 40s, he's already working on essays, expanding these ideas around a conservation ethic, recognizing that kind of strict natural resources management was not getting the conservation movement to where it needed to be. And of course, all of this then gets done uh, in the context of the Dust Bowl era. And so, you know, today we think about these ecological catastrophes that we are seeing and witnessing. Well, other generations, you know, relatively speaking, had similar experiences that they had to respond to. I mean, a massive, you know, th this is the wall of dust that eventually hit Washington, D.C., uh, that blew from the plains all across our country. And so this inspires him to actually start taking action on his own. Up till this time, he's been a public servant. He's been an educator. Now he buys his own farm and has to have the responsibility of taking care of it. And he specifically purchases a, a piece of property that is worn out. There are no trees on it. Uh, he describes it as kind of left for dead, if you will. 
and they plant 3,000 trees a year for the first five years. For almost four of those years, they have 100% mortality. So they go out, they plant 3,000 trees, they all die. They come back out the next year, they plant 3,000 trees, they all die. They keep doing this. There would have been a rebellion in my family long before year five, led by myself, I'm sure. Uh, but they keep coming out, they keep planting. Finally, the climate begins to change, and they start to have success. They would plant over 40,000 trees on their property. Again, not all of them made it, but that's what they did to restore that place back to health. <clears throat> and as he's doing this, he's starting to find his voice, and he's writing non-technical essays. If you've read the book, you might know Marshland Elegy. That's effectively the first essay he ever writes that would later appear in the collection of essays that would become his seminal work. And that was as early as 1937. And the book, again, was published in 1949. So <clears throat> 1937 is this pivotal year. He starts writing uh, these essays for a more popular audience. He writes uh, what would become Guacamaya, or originally titled Thick-Billed Parrot of Chihuahua. Anybody remember this from a San County Almanac? That was published in a technical journal, The Condor. Nobody other than Aldo Leopold could have gotten that piece of writing published in a scientific journal. So it also speaks a little bit to the stature he had within the field uh, and how important he thought it was to begin to expand the field and open people's eyes that we weren't going to have to just think with our mind, we were going to have to start thinking with our heart. So there's 41 essays that end up in a San County Almanac. <clears throat> the first section, uh, if you've read it, is, is kind of chronological. It walks you through the seasons. He's, you're kind of going for a walk uh, with a professor. The middle section are these diagnoses of conservation issues. And then the upshot is the final section where he lays out this conservation philosophy that Rich articulated uh, about a land ethic where we have this responsibility to take care of the natural world and to take care of ourselves. 17 of the essays had been published previously. So some were written de facto for the book. Uh, others were, again, kind of recomposed out of other pieces that he had written previously. And so, uh, but this was a journey for him. He got rejected at least three times. You could say five times if you read, all, depending on how you read a rejection letter from different publishers. A couple were still hanging on uh, when he finally got word from Oxford University Press that they would publish the book. Um, but this is a foreword from an early edition. This foreword never got used. But he uh, writes, these essays are one man striving to live by and with rather than on the American land. I do not imply that this philosophy of land was always clear to me. It is rather the end result of a life journey. And so he's trying, again, to help the audience understand that, you know, all right, whatever we've done in the past doesn't mean that has to predetermine what happens in the future. And one of the most powerful examples of that is Thinking Like a Mountain. This is really probably his most signature essay. Uh, if you've read it, uh, you maybe even have been brought to tears by it. If you haven't read it, it's his articulation of an experience shooting a wolf uh, and how when he came upon the animal that he shot, he saw this fierce green fire die in its eyes. And it kind of was a paradigm shift for him, recognizing that um, we can't just be conqueror of the land, that we have to have a connection to the land. But that book, that was one of the essays that came late. He was challenged by one of his students, Arthur uh, Hochbaum, uh, to show that, in fact, you know, you're, it's not like you always knew this, right? Like you <laughs> made your own missteps. And um, in fact, we weren't totally sure whether this was a totally fabricated essay or not. Uh, but we did find evidence finally. I don't know if you can see this. Wheatley and I have killed two timber wolves. This is in 1909. But he wouldn't write that essay until 40 years later. So he's calling back on memories and experiences that he had and trying to repackage them uh, for the reader to, again, help them understand uh, what it was going to take to step up and into a land effort. 
Uh, and we found this documentation as we were uh, working on a, the, the first full length high quality documentary about Aldo Leopold titled Green Fire. Uh, this is available for free watching or downloads. I don't even think you download it anymore. You can just watch it right off of our website if anybody's interested. But back to the book. So again, here's 1944, five years before it finally come out. Uh, this is a rejection letter from Alfred Knopf, publisher. Uh, it writes, we have discussed your essays here and find that while we like your writing, they do not seem altogether suitable for a book publication. And then, like this is the really interesting part. Then it says, I wonder if you would consider making a book purely of nature observation. So basically what they're saying is, discard all that land ethic stuff, right? Like just that first section where you're talking about walking through the woods and what you see and what you're thinking, that's all we want. We don't want the land ethic stuff. And then Oxford University Press uh, ultimately would agree to publish the manuscript largely as we know it today. There are a few changes that were made. This is just one week prior to his untimely death up at his farm. So he never saw the book published. He never knew the title of Sand County Almanac. That is a little line that the, the family and friends that did the final editing of the book pulled from the, the final foreword that he wrote uh, that appears in the book now because Oxford University Press thought the title that Leopold was using, Great Possessions, and he was trying to challenge us to think about what we owned and how we own it and so forth, sounded a little bit too much like Charles Dickens. Uh, and so they were a little worried the audio, the readers might get confused. <clears throat> Again, he uh, is up at his farm just down the road of trash fire escapes from that farmstead. He, his wife, and his daughter come down the road to help suppress the fire before it hits the marsh and then kind of gain steam and, and you know, be much harder to control. Uh, he suffers a heart attack and passes away at the age of 61. Uh, he had had several health issues near the end of his life uh, that probably contributed to that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, certainly, um, even by that time, you know, a relatively young death. Uh, and again, the final editing is really led by his son, Luna Leopold, uh, and because Oxford was a little worried about whether the book would actually come to fruition. You know, just a week uh, previously, they had sent a letter saying, we'll publish it, uh, the author dies. They're like, well, maybe we need to move on. And the family and his graduate students said, no, we want to make sure this book uh, comes out and into the world. And so uh, they uh, did the final editing. And so uh, published in 1949, the year after his death. Uh, and again, we're still talking about it 75 years later. The initial reviews were largely positive uh, from writers of all different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, recognizing that this was a new contribution to kind of Western society literature uh, and a real extension from probably the only other closer, closest author being Thoreau. But not all reviews of Leopold's work were favorable. Everybody know who this individual is? This is Rachel Carson. Uh, Rachel Carson, there's a kind of interesting backstory. The scientific research that was done for her book, Silent Spring, on eggshell thinning, was largely done at the University of Wisconsin by Aldo Leopold's successor, Joe Hickey. Uh, he did the scientific research. He shared that data with Rachel Carson. She used that uh, in large part to build out her argument for Silent Spring. But in the 50s and in, in, um, late, well, in the 50s, before she wrote Silent Spring, anybody know any of her other books? She was one of the best natural history writers that we had. The Sea Around Us uh, uh, is a beautiful book. And so she was published by Oxford University Press. So they decided they were going to bring, Aldo Leopold was doing pretty well. And so they were going to bring a new book out under Aldo Leopold's name titled Round River. And as you can read, the journals of Aldo Leopold. Well, Rachel Carson was a very strong animal rights activist. And the journals of Aldo Leopold are largely his hunting journals. That's, what, that's how he came to understand the natural world. 
she was appalled and aghast. She called out a Leopoldus charlatan. She would by no means recommend that book to anybody. Um, and we don't have any evidence that she actually ever read a sand counter. I think that, you know, her early intro to Aldo Leopold was through uh, this work. And so uh, we don't have any documentation that she ever went back and read a sand counter on that. Uh, but they did come out with Round River. And then in, uh, in 1966, uh, Oxford University Press releases the first um, enlarged edition where they take some of the essays from Round River and put it in with the Sand County Almanac. Uh, and that comes out in 1966. And then in 68, they produced the first paperback edition of the book. And then what happens in 1970? Earth Day. And all of a sudden, the world is looking for good <clears throat> environmental writing. And there's not that much out there. So Aldo Leopold gets rediscovered. And then Oxford University Press uh, partners with Ballantyne Books to bring out this kind of combined edition of a Sand County Almanac and Round River into a cheap paperback copy. How many people first read a Sand County Almanac with a cover that looks something like this? This is the book that's mostly used on college campuses because for a long time it was just the cheapest. And then, it, you know, I got my first copy as a used book in the university bookstore. Uh, so they got recycled over and over again. And you can see these are book sales uh, of a Santa County Almanac, this peak in 1970, that we still, uh, you know, even book sales still have never matched that decade of the 1970s. <clears throat> but I contend that part of the reason this book has remained so vibrant and, and uh, vital is because of the Leopold family as a whole. Mrs. Leopold became a very staunch environmental advocate, working on different statewide issues in the state of Wisconsin after her husband passed away. She would bring dignitaries out to the shack to show them what they did at the property and kind of became the matriarch of the Leopold family legacy. But it really was a family legacy. There were five children. All of them became uh, prominent scientists and conservationists. And in fact, three are in the National Academy of Sciences. No other family has that many members in the National Academy of Sciences. And Aldo, dad never got in. He was never a good enough scientist to get in. Uh, so it really influential in their own domains and in their own rights. The first was Starker Leopold. He was the oldest. He followed his father's career most kind of Closely, he was a wildlife ecologist. He got his PhD in zoology at UC Berkeley. Uh, if you go to Mexico and you talk about Leopold, people know, they know Leopold. They know Starker Leopold. He wrote the book Wildlife of Mexico. He was a very prominent scientist in um, Latin America. And then in 1963, he writes the Leopold Report at the bequest of Secretary of the Interior uh, Stuart Udall, and in it, put forward that we should be managing our national lands uh, with fire in mind and the importance of uh, top predators uh, and ecosystem management. So he was, he was as far out ahead as his father in terms of understanding the actual management uh, regimes that were needed to keep landscapes healthy. And he became, I always say, he was our last kind of superpower in the conservation world. At one point, he was the president of the UC system. Uh, so he was really well connected politically with the economic leadership in the state of California uh, and through the Wildlife Society, which was kind of the premier ecological entity uh, until the late 70s and, and 80s. And then there's Luna Leopold. If anybody studies rivers, you know Luna Leopold. He was uh, a hydrogeomorphologist. At one point, he was the chief hydrologist for the US Geological Survey. If anybody's ever heard of an environmental impact statement, that is based on the work that he did to assess 
a potential airport in the Everglades of Florida, which by the way, the evidence showed that that would not be a good idea and amazingly was not built. Um, and so he uh, is kind of, if you work in water, Luna Leopold is one of the most prominent names. Then there was Nina Leopold Bradley. She became, she took on her mother's role as kind of the matriarch of the family storytelling. She traveled all over the country telling their story about how they took care of this land and in restoring it, it restored themselves and their family relationships. Uh, and she retired back to Wisconsin uh, in the 1970s. And really, they, it's her and her husband, Charles, there, who was a, a geologist who kind of launched the Leopold Foundation. Uh, it was a family-wide effort, but really they were full-time volunteers for 20 years. And she was a plant ecologist, uh, by the way. And then there's Carl Leopold, who's a plant physiologist. So you kind of see the trend here. They're all engaged in this stuff. Uh, his book was Plant Growth and Development. Uh, he had different uh, roles in different academic institutions. Uh, but his real interest was in restoring tropical forests. And they, he and his wife launched an effort in Costa Rica to restore a tropical forest using native species, which wasn't being done at the time. And then there's finally Estella Leopold, who we just celebrated her 97th birthday. She is uh, Starker, Luna, and Estella are the three members that are in the National Academy of Sciences. She is a palynologist. That means she studies fossil pollen. So she can, from a little, and I've seen her do this, like she sees this little grain of pollen, and she's, oh, that's an Asteraceae, uh, probably from, you know, 3,000 years ago. And so she can reconstruct what the vegetation would have looked like uh, during the time of the dinosaurs through her research. And um, she uh, also got involved with advocacy, and there is a, a national park called the Florissant uh, Fossil Beds outside of Colorado Springs that she helped document the importance of that fossil record there and then did the advocacy and scientific work uh, to help ensure that it got protected. So <clears throat> uh, when we think about, uh, again, the, this Leopold legacy, for many generations, it was built not just on Aldo. It was built on the families. Uh, proficiency and impact in conservation-related fields in many different ways. And <clears throat> I love this quote from Wallace Stegner. Uh, I don't know if folks know Wallace Stegner, a really important natural history writer, really involved with the Wilderness Society movement. And he talks about Aldo Leopold's The Sand County Almanac will be one of the prophetic books of, of humanity. And uh, he wrote that back in 1985. And then a couple of years ago, an artist in New York called Diana Wiege put together a book that she calls The Earth Anthology. And it's writings from all different cultures from all over the world that talk about the importance of land ethics or this ethical relationship uh, to the, the land. And so I, I love to put those two together because it's really this embodiment of this idea that Stegner had that uh, we're going to have to understand all of these voices that help us uh, recognize our relationship with the natural world. Uh, and then there's a couple of scholars. So, you know, there's, there's the, the, the work that's done. And then you have to find a couple of champions who care about this stuff and help get your work out there. And three critical ones are Susan Plotter, Kurt Miney, and Baird Calicott. And these are in different realms. Susan Plotter was an environmental historian, wrote the first biographical work on Aldo Leopold in 1974. That got followed up and expanded by Kurt Miney uh, with his dissertation and book in 1988. And then Baird Calicott is a philosopher and ethicist and really helped articulate uh, and build out the, the kind of fundamental values and principles of the land ethic from a kind of academic phil philosophical perspective. So these are just a couple, there are others, but these are pretty formative voices that went back into the Leopold legacy, tried to understand it, interpret it, and, and help us understand the importance of that life story and work. And then in 1982, uh, the children decided to give away the farm. That's kind of how I like to put it. I mean, you know, they recognized that 
their dad's work is just more and more important. Uh, Nina at that point is living a mile down the road from the shack. People are just showing up in her driveway saying, where is this place? That I've, I've read this because they don't even know, right, that she's related to Aldo Leopold. So they're like, I'm looking for this place that some of this Aldo Leopold guy wrote about, and I hear it's down this road. And so they finally kind of realize that they really need to do something to ensure that their father's legacy is taken care of and then also built on and and that there's an interpreter and advocate for it. So they uh, create the Leopold Foundation. They literally give their family property to the foundation. So uh, the foundation is the owner and steward of that site, which is now National Historic Landmark. And they assign the rights to his writing. <clears throat> so we are the executor of Leopold's literary estate. And they weren't a particularly wealthy family, but uh, that book, we still get $30,000 a year in royalties from book sales of a San County Almanac. So that's effectively an endowment uh, that they left to the foundation. Early on, that was most of our budget. And you know, to me, it, again, it's this example that Aldo started that the children uh, followed up with of, of kind of walking the talk, of investing in community, sharing uh, their farm, their father's and their family's legacy with the world to expand the community. And uh, this is a, a graph of citations of a San County Almanac. You can see kind of in 1982, um, it's still bumping around. There's, it's out there. And then uh, in part because of the work of the Leopold Foundation and the family to really kind of promote their father's legacy, uh, the, the book begins to kind of get more traction in the academic world. Uh, and you can see that kind of exponential growth in the 2000s. We're still trying to find a, figure out what happened where it tails off a little bit and then update this data to the present. That was done by a scholar, uh, Chi Fang, a, a Chinese scholar who's teaching in Taiwan now. Uh, <clears throat> and so again, the, the family invested in continuing the work that they started uh, on their sand farm. We now do uh, all sorts of ecological management across that landscape. Uh, in particular, what we are supporting are grassland birds across about a 44,000 acre a landscape, uh, a, a guild of species that are in severe decline in North America. Uh, and we stitch together uh, about 10,000 acres of public and private ownership that we're managing in concert with one another to ensure that uh, the kind of work that the family started there along the Wisconsin River continues. These are our ambassadors, grassland birds. Uh, these are the species that are struggling for habitat uh, and that our work helps provide. Uh, if folks have not seen a significant sandhill crane migration, you really must. It is North America's most amazing wildlife uh, migration and wildlife spectacle. Uh, if you can get out to Nebraska, that's where you should really go. They have about 400,000 cranes that pass through in the spring of the year. But now uh, in Wisconsin, we have about 100,000 cranes that come through and right out our back door behind the Leopold Shack, we'll have 15,000 cranes come each night uh, to roost on the river. And remember, when Leopold wrote Marshland Elegy in 1937, he was predicting their extinction, or at least uh, elimination from the Midwestern landscape. There were only 100 cranes in Wisconsin in 1937. And now we have 15,000 come to roost every night right behind the Leopold Shack. Again, a bit of a story about what can happen with resilience, with patience, with investment in habitat uh, and policy. And we celebrate that now with the International Crane Foundation that has its own origin story connected to the Leopold legacy. They're just down the road. But if you're looking for a great time to come out, it's in November and you can ask Tom and Kathy uh, when to come and uh, what you should do when you come visit for that. So uh, we also have taken the shack and made it virtual. Uh, there's a virtual tour. So if you can't come see us, check it out. Uh, you can see points of interest that connect back to the book. 
uh, and the essays. So we try to bring the book to life uh, when you're out there. And then some of this is now uh, when you're on site, we are using technology to convey some of that story. It's, I got a great tour of this facility with Rich today, and it is so resonant with things we did when we built our center uh, that is built out of the trees that the Leopold family planted in the 30s and 40s. And so many of the same green building techniques uh, we used there that you used here. There's some things you used here that I wish we would have known about uh, that are really cool. Uh, but another example of, of what the land ethic would look like in the 21st century. And then we are continuing to bring the book out in different packages uh, and formats uh, for different readers and different audiences. Um, and uh, I know uh, Logan Berry Books has a couple of these editions downstairs. Um, this one is a Library of America. It's basically our country's Hall of Fame for writers. And so if you are selected to have a volume in that collection, it's kind of the pantheon of, of writers in, in the United States. So it's the entirety of a Sand County Almanac, as well as some of his correspondence with other key colleagues, other essays. Uh, and some biographical information. So it's really kind of the one-stop shop uh, for Aldo Leopold if you want to dive deeper. And then this is, these are the most recent editions. Uh, again, uh, they have the book on the left downstairs. has a new uh, foreword by Barbara Kingsolver, uh, recent Pulitzer Prize winner. And then uh, it will be interesting, the book is coming out of copyright not only in the United States, we've got a few more years in the United States, but internationally. So the United Kingdom uh, just released its own edition and there's an introduction by Dale Jameson, uh, a very influential uh, and thoughtful philosopher about the important, uh, importance of the book. And all of this is being done, you know, as we go through this social reckoning about uh, some of our challenging past. And we're trying to do our own homework to understand, you know, what we know about Aldo Leopold, what we know about the conservation movement uh, to ensure that the land ethic moving forward is really welcoming and inclusive of all perspectives. Uh, and so <clears throat> these are what I call the top three challenges for a land ethic to remain relevant in another 75 years. The first one is the land ethic will need to help reform the traditional economic and worldview to include conservation concerns. Ongoing challenge for all of us. Number two, the land ethic will need to extend across the landscape and recognize connections from urban to rural. And then three, a land ethic will need to embrace and be embraced by new constituencies. So the first one, <clears throat> this work is being done uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, the work of the Center for Humans and Nature, a book, Thinking Like a Planet, by Baird Calicott, uh, the International Society for Environmental Ethics, just some of the entities that are asking and framing up the questions about how do our values get expressed in economics. And then uh, two, a land ethic will need to extend across the entire landscape. Uh, so this you know, allows us to care about and invest in everything from a pollinator garden, garden in a backyard to designated wilderness areas and everything in between. And I will say, uh, in talking with the team here, that's one of the things I'm most impressed with the Western Reserve Land Conservancy is from urban Cleveland to uh, to working land, uh, agricultural easements, to conservation land protection. Uh, this is, that's what, how we need to be thinking about conservation these days. Um, and that's relatively new, and we're talking a little bit about it, but this is, I think, one of the first places I've seen where it's so actively being pursued uh, and, and success is being achieved. And then, uh, the land ethic will need to embrace and be embraced by new constituencies. So I don't know if folks are familiar with the work of Green 2.0, but it's just one of the places that is documenting how underrepresented certain aspects of our population are in the conservation community. And so being cognizant of that and committed to that is really important for all conservation work 
uh, to move forward so that the future of conservation really reflects our society. And here's a couple of the organizations doing some of that work, Center for Whole Communities, Outdoor Afro, uh, Center for Diversity and the Environment. Um, all this is, is kind of different in different ways about engaging and empowering uh, different aspects of our society to engage in conservation work. <laughs> um, and if you wanna understand some of this better from a historical perspective, uh, Michelle Nyhouse's book, Beloved Beast, does a great job of really documenting uh, some of the challenges of the conservation community and, and yet celebrating the successes and where we're at today. So it's really a great read that helps kind of put Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, some of these historical figures into uh, historical but also contemporary perspective. And so some of the things we're trying to do is just amplify those voices that are out there. And uh, our upcoming Leopold Week program uh, will have a, a variety of different writers from science uh, to culture, fiction, uh, but trying to find voices from different backgrounds and different formats, all that are kind of aligning and converging on this idea of a conservation ethic. And the other thing is to continue to engage the global community. So the book has been translated into 14 different languages. Well, actually 15. We didn't even know it had been translated uh, into um, Taiwanese until Tom and Kathy were in the, in the airport and sent us a picture of it there. So uh, we don't get any royalties out of that book, but that's okay. That's terrific that uh, others across the, the, the globe are finding resonance in Leopold's voice and then adding their own cultural context to it. Who are the voices in their country or their regions that are working on these same things? And just a couple of examples. This is in Croatia. They have a whole exhibit on Aldo Leopold. And just like this room is inspired by a Sand County Almanac, their work is inspired by a Sand County Almanac. And this is in Turkey. Uh, this is the Turkish translator of a San County Almanac who came, spent uh, a, a month with us trying to understand the deeper aspects of the book so that she could ensure that she would capture that uh, in her own language and then took it back and does these workshops over the course of the year to get her community engaged in and applying a land ethic. So, that's where we're at. Those are the things that we're gonna need to do. It's why it's terrific that folks like you are coming out uh, tonight to talk and be in conversation about where conservation is at and where we're going. And we need all of you. Leopold invited us to the table uh, to play a role in whatever we can. And so <clears throat> you can uh, join us in this effort by signing up for our e-newsletter. What we're trying to do is catalyze a land ethic movement. And so you'll get two emails uh, a month. One will be more intellectual, philosophical content, historical aspects about, a San County, about the land ethic. And one will be a little bit more fun and trivia based about Leopold. Uh, so a little something for everybody. And you can join us for upcoming virtual programs. Uh, and you can continue to support the Western Reserve Land Conservancy because Leopold's idea does not matter if it is not alive and engaged in local communities and in local landscapes. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for being here. And thank you for the opportunity to share this story about how and why we're still talking about a land ethic. So we definitely have time for some questions. Does anyone have a question? Great. Oh, I'm a very friendly bell. Hi, Peter Whitehouse, Case Western Reserve University. Um, in, in researching um, Aldo Leopold, I befriended Kurt Miney, and just a wonderful man and made many contributions. And through him, I met actually Estelle and Carl. So that was great. Um, uh, but I arise to speak to the quote that you showed twice in your talk that Kurt identified in the latest version of your 
essay, your newsletter as the most important thing Leopold said, and that was he proposed the land ethic as a product of social evolution to which we would all contribute to. And it is in that context that I rise to think of a seven generations perspective on this ethic. Because one of the puzzling things about Leopold was how and what the effects were of indigenous people. And, and uh, Scott Momaday, who just died, the Pulitzer Prize winning and, uh, Native American writer, wrote uh, in his uh, chapter uh, on the land ethic that we could not, uh, if we don't have a land ethic, we just can't live. So clearly land ethics belongs and emerged in different places. So looking backwards, I'm gonna, I apologize. Here's the opportunity I think as a physician. Van Rensselaer Potter, who invented the word bioethics, literally the word bioethics in 1970, uh, dedicated both of his books, the first one being called Bioethics of Bridge to the Future, to Aldo Leopold. And if there is anything that our healthcare system needs today, in my opinion, it is a land ethic. So I would urge you in terms of your and the outreach that you're making, and of course I'm happy to help you, and I'm obviously presenting this to the audience. Let's involve healthcare systems and how they think about the ethic in relationship to human and ecological health. Rich will be speaking at our upcoming conference on climate and health education uh, next month. So those are just a couple of things. Look backwards to the indigenous people who can engage, including health. Thank you. him about the, you know, these delights and dilemmas, the, but there are these delights of being outdoors and, un, and connecting to it. And so I think that is a body of research that's emerging and that the conservation community needs to consciously connect itself to uh, so that we can also, this is a community level issue, but it also has to be at the individual level issue too. How do we keep individuals and communities healthy uh, together? And, and that's going to depend on a healthy landscape, but we also need People, you know, when you are in duress, it's, it, you, your time horizon's not as long. So we have to keep all that in mind and help people uh, find the joys and the wonders outdoors uh, and then build systematic uh, efforts on there to ensure that everybody gets access to that and that we're providing access to everybody to all of our, our, our services and needs. Rich? <laughs> I know. This is a setup. Sorry. Tell us about the special with the books that you're selling as part of the 75th. And in this conversation, the, the, the selection that they brought is really wonderful. If you are not familiar with Drew Lanham or Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, or Lyanda Howe, those are, those are people you need to read and understand uh, because they are the Aldo Leopolds of today. And they are talking about these same issues from different cultural contexts and different uh, uh, considerations and perspectives. And uh, they are the kind of opening up of this conversation that is so important to have happen. And they need readers, right? I mean, this, that's the positive feedback loop. I love talking to writers because, you know, at one level, it's kind of ego-driven. They, they want you to buy their book. But it's really because they want to be in conversation with you. And so they're putting ideas out in the world. They're sharing those with us. And it's kind of our job to take those in and then uh, digest them and be in conversation with the, with the writers and with our colleagues as well. So they have a great lineup of, of you should spend a lot of money at the bookstore downstairs. And I don't even get a cut. Well, I guess I get a little cut from a Sand County Almanac sale. Thank you very much. And everyone.
Okay. Know that the party isn't over. We're going to head downstairs for a reception with Buddy. And um, there's food and drink in the... So stick around. So I will be very quick, but I have a couple of tokens of appreciation for Renee and Rich. Uh, one of the additions that I put up there was a, a, a copy of a San County Almanac that we made when we built the Leopold Center and we took the trees that the family planted and used them as construction timbers. We took some of the other material and we made a batch of paper. And then we printed a San County Almanac on the paper. We're about out of those, but, but there, there's still a few of those. But what we also did then is took the paper and uh, made Leopold quotes on it. So this quote is on paper made from a Leopold pine tree and the frame is pine from a Leopold pine tree. And so I wanted to present one to each of you for your hospitality and having me and more importantly, the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah.